So this is on um, basic design principles for developers, so um, sort of enabling developers to do a bit more design or be a bit more um, uh, adventurous. <laughs> um, about me, I am, I studied, my name, sorry, my name is Ricky. <laughs> I studied graphic design and I've been, got a job as a web designer in 2007 and then I've um, learnt front-end dev and PHP just sort of on the job and, and so now I sort of consider myself a front-end developer more than a designer. I don't really design anymore. Um, and I've been a Drupal user since 2009. I have one Drupal module up. <laughs> Proud of that. Um, so I just wanted to know a bit about you. How many front-end developers do we have in the room? Yep, okay. And back-end developers? Okay, cool. Um, any content editors or just non-developer people? Yeah? Cool. Good mix. All right. Um, so why learn about design? Um, essentially, we want to be able to communicate better with designers and to have a smoother sort of working relationship together, um, as well as being able to educate them about some of the responsive pitfalls that if anyone was in the last talk, Amelia's talk, you would have heard about them. Um, and then sometimes you, you'll quite often be handed incomplete designs by designers, whether their budgets run out or they just haven't considered all of the pages um, or the features you're doing. There's maybe a new feature to put into a site. Um, so in, in that case, you, you should be able to ideally be able to do some of it yourself um, based on the other designs that you've got. And then um, just I hopefully save a bit of time have a, have a go yourself, yeah. Um, so the start of it is typography. I think typography is the most important part of, of web design. Um, all websites are type, essentially. It's all information. Um, so optimizing that type and making it really readable and really accessible to people is, is part, a big part of design. Um, fonts, we've all got great web fonts to use now. Um, Ideally, you can just follow existing branding when, you, when you're coming up with these things. You shouldn't need to choose new fonts from scratch. Um, you might be c finding a web font that matches a, a print font or something like that. So just, And then just seeing which fonts you should use in your site. So here I've got um, the different types of fonts. We've got so sans serif fonts are generally modern, clean fonts. Um, always good for body copy because they're really good at, at a small size. Um, serif fonts are, are sort of a more classic look and they're really good for headings. Um, they can be a bit harder to read at small sizes but you could, if your body copy was like 16 pixels or up, you could use a, a serif font. Um, handwritten fonts are like really decorative and, and should just be used for headings really and, and in certain use cases. Same with script fonts, they're, they're much harder to read at small sizes. Um, and then monospace fonts, which is just equal character width, it's a very techy font. Um, easy to read for developers because we're used to looking at them. Um, you shouldn't use more than three fonts in, in a site or in a design. Um, this first blue example here is just two fonts and that's probably the easiest, just have two different fonts. Um, you can you can do three fonts in this case. Um, I think it's really good to have three fonts when there's like you've got a serif font for your body copy, you've got a, script, a decorative font for your headings, and then you could use a sans serif for smaller fonts like um, meta sort of information like dates and stuff or, or UI labels. Sans, uh, sans serif fonts are really good for them. Um, so that's a good example of having three different fonts in a, in a site. Um, this last one's four fonts, and you just, it's hard to do. It's really hard to do, even for really experienced designers to make four different fonts look good in the site. So it's, you just don't need to worry about it. Just avoid doing it. <laughs> um, you, you can do a lot with the weights and, and sizes of different fonts rather than needing a different font family altogether. You can just create that same hierarchy and that differentiation through, hi through font sizes and weights. Um, so you can see here I've just got four different font sizes and two different weights. So it's not hard to do. Um, some things that designers to sort of design a vocabulary, letting equals line height to 
to them and us. So it's sort of, again, the communication between you so you understand what each other are saying. Um, kerning is the same thing as letter spacing for us. Um, typesetting this stuff is, is a big part of what a, a traditional print designer spends a lot of their time on. It's, it's very important to them. Um, and it's not necessarily as applicable on the web, but there are some cases where it's relevant. Um, orphans are, as it says, a single word on its own line at the end of a sentence or paragraph, so paragraph in there being the orphan. Um, and that's, yeah, so th that one's a really hard one to control on a responsive website, but places where it might be worth focusing on that is in like a positioning statement or, or one sort of thing that you do have a bit more control over and it's less likely to change and you can at least make it, typeset it well for the major breakpoints of, of a design. Um, the last one's really for content editors. It's just that people skim, so use your heading weights that you've got all set up and, and break, break up your paragraphs so it's really easy to read. Um, this last one is um, CPL, which is characters per line. And it's sort of, there's, a, there's an ideal number of characters or words for each sort of the width of column of your text. And it really helps with readability. So you can see this first example. It's too short. It's uh, um, disjointed to read and it's just sort of just chunky a bit. And then this <coughs> other one is really too long. So by the time they get to the end of that line, their eye has to go all the way back to the beginning. And they'll quite often lose the line that they were on. So what was the next line by the time they get back? So that's a, so there's just sort of a middle point in between those two um, is what you're, what you're aiming for. And font size it relates to CPL as well. So you can see this second line here. If that was a big font size like I've got up the top, it would be fine. But it's just that it's so small and it's such a long line. It's hard to read. Um, these guys, um, personified.com forward slash typography, that's a really great calculator for this. So you can either just put in um, the column width that, you, that you've got and it'll tell you what font size to use to have that optimal sort of size. Or you can just put in the font size and it'll tell you what's a good column width to use. Um, and it also goes into um, other heading levels as well. So you can have your base body size and then using the golden ratio, it'll tell you what are good heading sizes as well to use. So you don't need to make it up. It's all um, online. Um, space and proximity um, refers to white space, vertical rhythm, and the proximity of elements. So it's all sort of relationships between things. Um, white space isn't necessarily white, it's just empty space. So it's, it's a term designers use um, and it can be confusing to people. They sort of think it's, you, you say you want a really white, lots of white space and then someone will think that you're just wanting them to have a really white website. It's not the same thing. Um, it's used to break up the site into digestible chunks. So it's sort of a really good example is your, your main column of text from your side column and you can have white space in between those to, to differentiate them and separate them. Um, you could use a line to differentiate them in, in your design, but that just adds noise. You often don't need it. You, you just add a bit more white space, and then it's simpler and easier to read. Um, a lack of white space is cheap. It, it is intentionally used to make something look cheaper. So you'll get it in those um, catalogues that are crammed full of stuff, and they're, they're a lower price point product. And that's what is that's what you use lack of white space for. Um, and then on the flip side, lots of white space is luxury. It's like, I can afford to waste this real estate. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so if you want your product to look really expensive, then use lots of white space. Um, vertical rhythm is quite a big thing, and I'm not going to go into it too <coughs> much, but it's basically the consistent pattern for the reader. So it's, the, um, it's like the lines, I suppose. Um, if you had like two columns of text next to each other, and then if you had a good vertical rhythm, it wouldn't matter how many words were in each column or how many lines of text there were or where the breakpoints were in those columns, in those paragraphs, they would always still line up. 
next to each other. So just have a consistent line, that's your vertical rhythm. Um, it's quite a big thing and you can read a lot about it online. Um, proximity of elements is the relationship between elements demonstrated by the use of white space. So you can see here this date, this is probably like in our side column, it's some news articles and we've got a date and it's got the same amount of white space on the top as it does on the bottom and it's hard to see what news article this date might belong to in this example. Um, so you can easily fix that by adjusting the white space to, to create that relationship with something and to give it proximity. Colour. <laughs> Colour is a really big thing. It's, it's hard. Um, I suppose you all saw the blue dress that wasn't a blue dress. <laughs> yeah. So it's perceived differently by everyone and then it's also... Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't blue dress, yeah. Um, and so it's also um, exacerbated by different monitors. We all have a different screen that's calibrated differently, so it's hard to have the exact colour that you choose be the thing that is what's seen. So, And especially for people that are colour blind, is there anyone <coughs> colour blind in the room, perhaps? No? Okay. Um, colour blind people see different colours to what we see. Um, the next slide is a bit offensive. So these are, these are really bad colour combinations. Um, so Sorry, I'll just go back to the first point. Follow the branding again. Just use what's already been designed, if you can. Um, yep, so these particularly bad colour combinations, and this is what someone that's colour blind will see. So it's really sort of low contrast, really sort of, you, they wouldn't get the message if you were using colour in that sort of way. And so for accessibility reasons, they say um, to never just have colour as the differentiator. So if your hover states are just colour, then they won't necessarily be seen by people that are colour blind. So they, they always say to have a, an underline as well as a colour change in those examples. Um, but you can use colour um, to make certain things stand out from the rest of your design. So if you've got a colour palette that's la largely blue um, and you want everyone to see that, that button on the bottom and you want everyone to click on it, um, it could be blue, it would fit in with the design, but you could also use a contrasting colour um, and have it stand out a lot more against the rest of the design and it's much more likely to be clicked on in that case. Orange has poor accessibility. Um, it's just one of those colours that has a pretty low contrast despite what it looks like to us a lot of time. Um, and these are some sites that will help you choose colour um, to be accessible. So the first one is for choosing your whole colour palette, you can basically say, um, I want every blue colour at this font size to be AAA accessible, and then it'll spit out every possible blue that you could use in your, in your design, and it's really cool. Um, and then the second one I use a lot to test existing colors, so it's, just, it's a calculator again. You put in a hex code, you put in the, so the foreground and the background color, and it'll tell you how accessible, how much contrast that color has. Um, I'll put these slides up online. Um, mobile design, I think I'm going way too quick. <laughs> um, so mobile design is basically reducing things and increasing other things. Um, so ideally you'd want to start small and enhance as the space increases. Um, so headings and text sizes would, would be um, initially done to that smaller carat CPL column width. Um, so you can have your, based on your mobile s s width thingies. <laughs> um, and then you, as it increases, you can, you can calculate up from that what, what the bigger sizes should be up to your desktop size. Um, buttons and links are the only things that you wouldn't, that would sort of the opposite. So they need to be increased on a smaller screen than on, on a desktop screen. And it's to allow for fat fingers, basically, so that there's a big hit area for buttons and links. Um, 
And Apple recommends a 44 pixel by 44 pixel sort of size. So whether it's like at least 44 pixels high, and then they say you can do like 30 pixels in the opposite way, just so that there's enough space. Um, and that's it. I think I did that way too quick. <laughs> I timed that so much longer at home. <laughs> yeah, lots of questions. <laughs> cool. So, um, I got in trouble with my manager just before I came into the talk because um, I said I'm going to talk and it's about um, how developers are not designers. <laughs> and he goes, Yeah, I'm looking at you like because you've got opinions about UX. <laughs> you're a developer, you know. Yeah. So you, you get the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Um. Oh, I suppose just repeat it for me again. Okay, so. Okay. And, um, I wonder if you've got um, thoughts about that, about you know, the separation between development and... Yeah, like I, I, I'm all for sort of making it more of a closer thing. Like I think designers and developers should work a lot closer together. Um, and I think managers should encourage that really, yeah. I think it's it just makes everything so much smoother. Like my own experience coming from a design background and then moving into development, that design experience has really helped me in my job um, and just made things better. I, I think it's a great thing and everyone should do it. Yeah. Yes. Um, text overlay on graphics, I suppose. What other recommendations? Yep, okay, so... Should not be done at all. Well, I've, I've done it here, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's certain sort of weights of text you can use and then having a drop shadow like I've got here is a really good tool just to increase a bit of contrast. Um, it can be done, it's just sort of, it's not a one size fits all thing, like you have to adjust it for every background image. You have to have different position of your text to be on the most clear part of the image. It's a fiddly thing. Um, and Yes, there are screen size changes, yeah. It's much harder to do on the web. Um, but it can be done, yeah. I also thought you like transparent Yep. Yeah, things like that, yeah. And the other thing is you could put like a sort of semi-transparent colour over the image, because you're worried about like the texture. Yep. You could have that extra layer in. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and you can just go and find a beautiful theme and build yep. a great Um I actually don't, but someone else might. <laughs> I think it. Yeah. Paid ones. What are your thoughts about those um, big libraries and using them or customizing them or just building from scratch? 
Um, I think they're a really good starting point for people when they're not necessarily as experienced in, in doing things from scratch. I definitely do. Um, I suppose I've always done it from scratch myself, but yeah, it's... Yeah. Yes. Um, Sorry, Amelia? Really? Yeah. Well, like, considering the questions about getting a, a team from an industry growth or something like that, do you think that it's best, um, like, at what point do you think someone could be ready to start making their own team from scratch? And, and do you think it's, like, important for developers to do that? Or do you think it's best to make, like, that you could achieve with the team working from, like, a customizable team? Yeah, I think it is important for developers to do it from scratch at least once. I mean, they might not like it and they might want to go back to their original way of doing it, but I think it's a good learning curve for people to do, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Quick question about um, print designers and graphic designers. Yep. Experience with either of those is a lot of my clients um, will have a print designer yep. on start and they can't understand why, well, I want this page to be exactly like this and they'll give you an April print out of the page. Yes, yeah. Um, Yeah, it is It is frustrating, yeah. Uh, even, like, I say if you can speak their language, you can you can explain things better to them, but um, it's still, it depends on the person, really, and how, how much of an ego they have, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, and then redo it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Cool. No one else? No? Early break then, I guess. <coughs>